Hello, I'm Antonia Lloyd-Jones and I translate from Polish. I'm going to read to you from Karolina or the Torn Curtain, the second in a crime series set in Krakow in the 1890s, which came out in the United Kingdom on Thursday. The author, Marila Szymiczkowa, is actually a married team of authors, Jacek Denel and Piotr Tarczynski. Here are the Polish editions of the first two books in the series, and then underneath them, the British editions of the same two books and the American editions. Their heroine, Zofia Turbotinska, is a busybody professor's wife turned amateur sleuth. And in the extract I'm going to read to you, she's trying to investigate the brutal murder of her housemaid and has arranged to meet and talk to a prostitute. Though, of course, she's never encountered anyone of the kind before, and she's about to learn yet another ugly truth about Krakow, her beloved intellectual city, which turns out to have a hideous underbelly. And she's afraid of being recognised in a seedy part of the local park. So she has disguised herself with a hat belonging to Franciszka, her cook. Zofia was now in a place entirely wrong for her. Instead of walking along Krakow's answer to the Corso, past the university buildings, nodding to the society ladies, returning the gentlemen's bows and making an impression with a fine hat from Lemberg or Vienna, she was sitting on a bench in her cook's miserable little bonnet, wearing a dress unearthed from the back of the wardrobe that dated from many seasons ago, and waiting for her appointment. The disguise was clearly performing its task because nobody paid her the least attention. In the distance, she could hear the trumpeter sounding the hour. She looked around her, but the person whom she was expecting did not appear to be in sight. A young man sat on the bench opposite, smoking a cigarette and reading a newspaper. Behind her, on Szczepanski Square, the market trading was now coming to an end. The peasants from the suburban villages were folding up their stalls and loading sacks of unsold cabbages, potatoes and carrots onto their carts. Perhaps that person has had a change of mind, thought Zofia. A woman in a dull grey outfit, undoubtedly one of the stall holders, tired from her long day's work, decided to rest a while. She sat down on Zofia's bench and let her head droop. She breathed noisily, coughing now and then. Sophia was starting to feel anxious. What if the person she had arranged to meet, approaching from a distance, were to see this other figure on the bench beside her, have second thoughts and not come any nearer? The whole subterfuge would be in vain. I think you're waiting for me, said the woman in the dull grey clothes in a low, hoarse voice. I think not, madam, replied Zofia, quietly but firmly. The woman gave no reply, but fixed her gaze across the gravel-coated path on a bed of dahlias, which, thanks to the assiduous care of the park keepers, flowered abundantly even in the inferior parts of the city gardens. But you have a veil, replied the woman, and I was to meet a lady in a black veil. Is it not you, madam? Zofia narrowed her eyes and finally took a close look at the woman. Her entire knowledge of the topic of prostitution came from literature. So she was expecting to see La Dame aux Ca Camellia, a wanton Jezebel in challenging makeup, a decidedly too revealing costume, endowed with vulgar yet undeniable allure. Was that not, after all, the quintessence of the profession? Meanwhile, beside her sat a person whose appearance was no different from that of a seamstress from the Grzegorzki district. Indeed, she was coughing in a somewhat consumptive manner, but there the similarity to the courtesan Violetta came to an end. She looked considerably older than Zofia. From under her headgear, greatly inferior in quality to Franciszka's little hat, strands of mouse-coloured hair protruded, damaged by curling, and coated in the remains of auburn dye. Her dress of the most wretched type 
with patches here and there, was not in its first youth. But worst of all was her face. The clumsily applied powder was incapable of concealing its horrifying red, if not purple, colour. It was as bloated as a balloon from the church fate in Emmaus. The lassie promised me a crown and an arf, the pitiful woman said. Zofia was speechless. Was this what a fallen woman was like? She had expected to see moral decline, but here before her eyes was the image of misery and despair. Were men really prepared to... Please, pay in advance, madam, or there won't be nothing doing, said the woman firmly. Still dumbfounded, without a word, Sophia reached for her purse. I already told the young miss, I don't do those things. If that's what you're after, madam, there is one girl, Mella, she's called. She lives in Krzygorski. I can give you the address. But I don't never touch that. I only do it in God's honest way. She uttered the words those and that in a tone that Zofia found surprising, though she had no intention of asking what those things were or why they went beyond the traditional repertoire of services offered by the woman sitting beside her. The reference to God seemed to her inappropriate, but she wasn't going to argue. There are more things in heaven and on earth than the philosophers have dreamed of, she thought to herself, but even I do not need to know about all of them. The business I have with you is not of a professional nature, she said, or at least not entirely. So what do you want, said the prostitute? No one ever wants anything else from me, but you know what. I would like to talk to you. Talk to me. Despite the veil, Zofia could see that in her puffy face the prostitute's eyes widened. The woman could not have been more surprised if Zofia had declared that she was expecting her to perform the Dance of the Seven Veils at a solemn assembly of the Arch Brotherhood of Mercy Charitable Society. So that is Carolina or the Torn Curtain by Marilla Shimichkova from One World Publications. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.